My name is Jonathan Eves. I'm a technical marketing engineer in the security policy and access team. And yeah, as was said, I'm going to talk about group based segmentation basics. So as an agenda, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction and I'm going to concentrate a little bit about where to start on the segmentation journey, because I've, I've speak to several customers and they often say, you know, how can we get started? So I'll go on to some use cases. The first one I'm going to talk about is just providing visibility. And this is going to be without any extra configuration on your access devices. So this is going to be something for visibility. And then other use cases are, of course, at some point we'll want to enforce, right? We're talking about segmentation. We're talking about, um, you know, restricting communications from one device to another. And so we're going to talk about enforcement. So the first use case is enforcement within a single platform. Now I'm going to move on to enforcing across multiple platforms. And then at the end, just going to talk about Cisco DNA Center for a short while and how it can help you on the segmentation journey. So introduction then and where to start. So to begin with, I've written a, a white paper, which um, you may be aware of, but if not, then it's worth having a look at. If you just go on a browser and search for Cisco segmentation strategy, you'll see, you'll find this link. And it covers a lot about the technology, how it works, but also some best practices. So the, it, it tells you the best practices are really to start, start with desired business goals in mind. So come up with a, a business reason for deploying segmentation. And many use cases can be localized and do not need to be deployed globally. So think of just one network access device, if you like, or a floor or a building. You don't have to um, deploy this throughout the network globally to begin with. You need to keep groups as simple as possible while still meeting policy requirements. And unlike traditional um, segmentation or access control, adding dynamically assigned groups later should be fairly straightforward. And it shouldn't be necessary to transfer complexity. And by that, I mean, you know, if you've got extensive groups in Active Directory, you know, that doesn't mean you need extensive number of groups in terms of security groups. And consider if all roles need a tag assigned as non-tagged assets can assume a default role, which, which helps with scalability. And I'm going to go into what groups and tags are in a minute. And of course, flagship product is software defined access with Cisco DNA Center. Um, if you're thinking about SD access, then consider what segmentation is required at the macro level. So that's at a virtual network or a VRF level. And then you can think about what segmentation is required within that. So that's at the micro level. So that's within the, the, the VRF itself using SGTs. So if you're used to IP access control lists, then you're used to lists like, like this, which is not intuitive. It's very complicated if you've got tens or hundreds of thousands of these entries. And of course, these are all based on what we call local um, identities. So it's IP. So you need these lists per site and per region, and you'll have many, many of these. Um, so unless you live and breathe your network and get to, used to all of these port numbers and the IP addresses within your network, it's just a blodge of unintelligible text and you know, it's not intuitive. Anybody comes up against these lists, it's very, very difficult to figure out what's going on. And of course, people spend quite a bit of time adding these access control lists and less time removing them. So over time, they become obsolete, but they still remain because it's dangerous to remove them. So this is IP access control lists, which we, you know, tend to live with today. So what, what are we talking about here? So we're talking about groups or grouping items together with similar security requirements. 
So if you've got similar security requirements, like for perhaps guests or employee groups or IoT servers, then if they need similar security requirements, then if you group them together, then you can simplify your security policy by adding permits and denies and layer four controls between the groups instead of between the individual elements. So this is what the technology is all about. The groups are called security groups and all items within a particular group are assigned the same security group tag. So this is how we keep track of what is in what group using a security group tag or an SGT. So making the business intent clear. So as opposed to IPACLs, if we're using group based technology, then you can use some meaningful constructs. So this is just CLI on a Cat 9K. And if you look at the policy permissions, it's clear to see that the default policy is a deny IP. Now, going further, if you download specific policies, you'll be able to see that this is from the scanners group to the storage packs group permit IP log. So it's very easy to understand. And another one as well from employees to directory systems permit LDAP and HTTP. So rather than having to trawl through lots of IP ACLs without knowing really what they are or what's behind them, this is what makes the policy intuitive. Now we don't get down on the CLI too much these days. Of course, these policies are automated and managed by controllers. And this is an ICE webinar. So of course this policy is managed by Identity Services Engine. That is the policy engine for the solutions, but the policy can be orchestrated or automated from Cisco DNA Center as well. And we have a, a matrix in Cisco DNA Center, which is pushed into ICE. And it's a nice simple matrix where the source group down the left of the matrix column, down the left side, that's the source and the destination is across the top. And it's the intersection which does the magic, if you like. So you, you tell it you want to permit traffic or deny traffic or only permit um, certain layer four ports. So this is what makes the technology intuitive and meaningful. And the idea is you can add your groups which are meaningful to your, your network, right? These are examples of scanners, storage, employees, directory systems, but you can add whatever SGTs you want and name them appropriately within your network. So main functionality blocks then for the technology that we've got three. So on the left, we've got classification. So this is what we we say when we're putting things into groups. So it may be users, it may be IoT devices, it may be servers. We're putting them into a group. And what we actually do that's flashing there is we assign the learnt IP of the entity, we place it into a group. So we create an IP to an SGT. Remember that's security group tag. So we put it into an IP to SGT mapping or a binding. So you may have a thousand employees in a particular group. All those a thousand, we can assign them into the same group and we have a thousand IP to SGT mappings or bindings, but only one group. And your security policy would be simple because you're only adding your policy just to permit or deny traffic to or from that one group. Now on the right here, we have enforcement, we're talking about segmentation, then we would at some point want to either deny or permit traffic between these groups. And that's what the enforcement pillar here is all about. So we enforce on different platforms and we either permit or deny or allow certain layer four ports between the groups. Now, if enforcement is happening on a different platform than your network devices are connected, then you have a multiple platform um, scenario. And that's what the middle pillar here is about. The propagation is about propagating these IP to SGT mappings from one place to another so that enforcement can happen. And we talk about that a little bit later on. So there's these three pillars, classification, propagation and enforcement. And on the bottom right, we've got some um, third parties there. This is a fairly old slide, actually. So we've only, I've only listed one there, but all of the um, firewall vendors um, I say all, but a lot of the main firewall vendors support this technology now as well, as well as Open Daylight and other third parties like Bayshore. 
now right at the bottom i've put some acronyms here sgt i've said it's security group tag you might have heard it being called a scalable group tag within sd access and cisco DNA center but you, you'll see that change soon actually to be security group tag again but it's an sgt cts is something you see on the cli a lot it's cisco trusted security but again it's about this technology with sgts it's a, a policy um it's a policy using groups so that's what gbp is it's a group based policy and we used to have this term called TrustSec. I say we used to, it was a brand that um, that we had, but we released it recently. So it's not an official brand for us anymore, but you'll still see the term quite often and you see it in the GUI and you'll see it in the demos today. So all these terms are talking about this technology. What is the ultimate aim? Well, if you've got a number of users here on the left, for example, it might not be just users, it may be IoT devices or what have you. And you may have a lot of them, but the idea is to put them into a simple groups, a small number of groups, so that you can reduce your policy. And on the destination side, you may have servers or services. And again, the idea is to reduce them down into a small number of groups. And the idea is to have your policy between these groups. So permit or deny with your group based policies. And this is how we simplify our security policy in the network. So let's move on to um, the first use case, which is classifying endpoints in localized areas. Remember the localized area, you can start small on a single switch or a single floor. You don't have to um, configure this across the network if you don't want to to begin with. So what, is, what does this mean, classification? So this first use case is without any CTS or SDT configuration on the access switches at all. OK, now this is an ICE webinar, so you'll be used to devices authenticating. So let's say we've got a user connecting to this access switch and we authenticate to ICE. Now, as well as or instead of assigning a DACL or a DVLAN, we can assign an SGT. So down the bottom left, you can see that this person has authenticated and through authorization, we've assigned an SGT. In this case, we've assigned the doctor's SGT, which has a um, it has a number which is 34. And we create this IP to SGT binding. In this case, that doctor has an IP of 10 10 10 1. So the IP to SGT binding is 10 10 10 1 mapped to doctor's SGT. And this is classification using ICE. It's a dynamic way of assigning that SGT to devices that are connecting and authenticating on the network. Again, we've got a scanner here that may be connecting, it may have a dot. Well, Supplicant, or it may just be we may just authenticate with MAB, but anyway, we authenticate and that is authorized on the network with another SGT. In this case, we're assigning the scanners SGT, which is has a an SGT of 36. So these do have numbers, but what's meaningful to your customers and yourselves are the names that you give them because it's very clear what they are. So this is classification. Now because ICE is the one that's assigned the SGTs, it has all the knowledge needed to share that with other systems. So, for example, we can send this classification information to Secure Network Analytics, which was formerly called StealthWatch. So if we can send this information over PX Grid to StealthWatch and it's also receiving NetFlow, then you can see group to group communications within StealthWatch. There's no configuration still on these um, access switches, but StealthWatch become, will become aware of it. Also, we have an app on Cisco DNA Center called Group Based Policy Analytics, and if I have time later, we'll go into that a little bit. But this also receives NetFlow, and again, we can see, see group to group communications, um, and immediately you might be able to see, well, if I've got a guests group and it's sending traffic to confidential servers group, immediately you might be able to see that that's something that shouldn't be happening. Also, we can send PX Grid to any number of devices. One is our Firepower Management Center. And this, this use case is all about visibility, but you can see right here that FMC with its connected FTDs can start to enforce using this traffic if needs be. And of course, we have something that's called SXP, which is Security Group Tag Exchange Protocol. 
And this protocol is a very simple protocol. It just sends the IP terrestrial mappings from one place to another. So the whole point of this is just to show that without any configuration on your access switches, so they could be a very old 2960s, for example, or it could be devices from another company, another vendor's devices. It's ICE that's assigning the SGT to these sessions, and you can gain visibility by sending that information from ICE out to other network components. And as I say, the, the access switches, I've shown that the IP to SGT is down here, but if these switches don't support SGTs, then the authorization reply, including the AV pair with the SGT, will just be dropped by the switches. So they can be third party switches or, or, or older legacy switches. You can still get the visibility in your network. So I'm going to show a demo of this visibility. Um, I've got an access switch here. Initially, I'll show SGT and the authorization table in ICE. And then I'll show there's no CTS or SGT config on the switch at all. All, all that will be on there is just AAA and RADIUS, which is what we need for the user to authenticate and authorize with ICE. I'll authenticate a user, and I'll use the doctor example. And I'll authorize the doctor, and I'll give the doctor an SGT, and the SGT is called doctors, which makes sense with an SGT number of 34. And if you look in the demo, this MAC address ends 5622, and it has an IP address ending 111. So when that's happened, I'll show that ICE has the information needed to send that visibility out to other network devices. So this is the demo then. So this is Identity Services Engine. So we, we add these groups or SGTs under the trust set components. This is just a list of groups. What's important is the name and there's our doctor's name and it just has, happens to have a number 34. You're probably more used to policy sets. This is our policy set with the authorization table. And here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit this rule called doctors in building management. And all I'm doing is looking the, look up in Active Directory for, the, for the, the user within the doctors group. And I'm gonna assign a security group called doctors. So that's the authorization rule I'm gonna use in ICE. So in, the, in CLI then in the switch, I'm going to show that there's no CTS configuration here. So there's no CTS configuration. There's no CTS credentials, which would be needed if you were going to be enforcing on this box. All I've got on here is some radius configuration. So that's radius, so that I can authenticate the user and some AAA. So there's the AAA configuration. And also, if we're going to be enforcing, we would need a protected access credential, a PAC, where there's no PAC downloaded on this switch, and there's no environment data. And I'll show, talk a little bit about that later, but there's none of that. So this is a vanilla switch with no SGT config. Now, these are the sessions on this switch. I'm going to be connecting the user to gig 102. There's no session here at the moment. And I talked about IP to SGT bindings, the classifications, no classification on this switch at all. The table is empty. So let's go over to my doctor and let's enable the NIC on the, do on the doctor's machine. So we'll enable it. The doctor's logging on. Okay. We're connected. And in CLI again, um, let's have a look at the auth sessions on the switch. Now we do have a, a session on gig 102 now. It has that MAC address ending 5622. So if we have a look at the detail of this session, you can see that's our IP ending 111. Doctor 1 has logged on. And it's assigned the SGT34, which is the doctor's group. So this has been classified into the, into the doctor's group. Now this is the IP to SGT mapping on the switch. So this is IP ending 111 to 34. And again, if this was a third party or an older switch, you wouldn't see that. But ICE is the one that has this IP to SGT intelligence. So if we look at, look at the live logs, we can see that this user has logged in to ICE. We see Dr. One, the MAC address ending 5622 there. 
It's hit the authorization rule of doctors and building management. If you remember, that's what we had in ICE. It's learned the IP address through accounting. So that's ending 111. And it's been assigned the doctor's SGT. Now, in our database within ICE, we can see this IP to SGT mapping. So there's the IP to SGT mapping. And this is the source of the table that's used to send this data out to other devices. So we can send this data out through SXP to connected devices, and we can send this information out through PX Grid. So this just proves that you don't need any configuration on your access switches. This is a great place to start. You just enable some SGT authorization within ICE, and that can be shared to other devices without touching your access layer or any devices in the network. So it's a very, very simple way to get started. This is just for reference. It's just some configuration that I had on my switch, just showing no SGT or CTS configuration on there at all. So that's the first use case. Um, so let's move on to enforcing. You know, we're talking about segmentation. We may want to segregate some of these, some of our devices in the network. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we need a bit more configuration on our devices, on the devices that we want to enforce on. OK, this isn't necessarily the access layer. You may want to enforce in distribution, for example, and send your classification up from access to distribution. But wherever you want to enforce, we configure these CTS credentials, and that needs to match with what we've configured in the network access device within Identity Services Engine. And we've also got some extra configuration there on the left. So we've got some more AAA configuration with the CTS authorization list. Instead of a key being used on the radius server, we change that to use a PAC key. Remember, the PAC is protected access credential, which we use to communicate using EAPFAST up to ICE. And we have to tell the platform that we want to enforce. So we enforce all the layer three and layer two interfaces that we want to enforce on. So that's how you'd configure it to, to enforce. And once it's configured, the network access device will connect to ICE and download this protected access credential. And it'll also download the what we call the environment data. And this has some information. You see in bold on the top left, we've got an SGT for the device itself. We also have a CTS server list, which is the server, typically in an ICE persona, where this device will download policy from. And it has the whole list of SGTs available, as well as some timers down the bottom right hand side. So this is the environment data, which is downloaded to the enforcing device. So let's let's talk about how this would work then. Remember, the first um, stage would be classifying endpoints into a group. And because we're on a single platform, you know, we may have two endpoints on this on this one platform, and then we'll enforce between them. So how would this work? Well, the first thing is we're talking about ICE, but the policy can be automated from Cisco DNA Center should you want to. So you can push that policy in from DNA Center. That is an option. Um, otherwise, you would configure that directly on ICE. So a user connects to the access switch. We authenticate and authorize. Again, we will use the doctor's example. And we assign the SGT, which is called doctors, but it has a number of 34. And again, it's the same MAC ending 5622 with an IP address there ending 111. Now, as soon as that switch knows it has that new SGT that needs protecting, it downloads part of the policy matrix. Now, the part that it downloads is the column which is destined towards the SDG. So it's this column in the matrix which is downloaded um, to that access switch, and it sits in the access switch ready for traffic uh, in, that's flowing in the data plane. So this is really how we scale, right? We only download part of the matrix which is needed to protect the SGTs on a switch that the switch knows about. So that's the first endpoint. Now, let's say we have another endpoint connecting, a scanner in this case, and we authenticate with ICE, and ICE assigns the scanner's SGT in this case. This is a MAC address ending FDF2, 
and this has an IP address ending 110. But again, as soon as that switch learns that it has this new SGT to protect scanners, it'll download part of the matrix, and the part that it downloads is the column that's destined towards the scanner's SGT. So again, that's how we scale. Now this all happens within you know, milliseconds, right, when these devices are authenticating and connecting to the network, and they've downloaded the policy ready for anything to be sent in the data plane. So the next thing that might happen is that doctors may try and send traffic towards the scanner, and the access switch will say, right, I know what group the source IP is in, because, you know, we've ICE has told me that it's in the doctor's SGT, and I know what, what group the destination IP is in, because ICE has told me that as well. So we know the source SGT, we know the destination SGT, and therefore we can enforce at egress. So this is how the classification works, as well as the enforcement, and how the policy is downloaded from ICE. So let's have a quick demo of this use case. So we've got Identity Services Engine, and let's have a look at the policy matrix in here. So this is under the TrustSec, TrustSec policy menu, and this is the matrix. And so we can see from the doctors to scanners group, this currently has a permit action. Now on the CLI, again, and remember I said we need download a pack. So this is the showing the pack and the environment data, which is needed when we're enforcing on a platform. Now let's have a look at the authenticated sessions. Um, we still have gig 102 is still in place for our doctors is 5622. Let's have a look at the, um, the detail of that. You can see that doctor one is logged in, IP ending 111, and it's assigned the doctor's SGT. Now the scanner Mac has not been seen yet, so there's no session for it. Um, so we'll do that in a minute, but let's have a look at the IP to SGT mapping. Here we can see there is a mapping for that IP ending 111 for the doctors. And have we got a policy downloaded? Well, we do have one that's destined towards the doctors, which is a deny IP. And that's what this one is, production to doctors. That's what that policy is that's downloaded. Right, so let's enable the NIC on the scanner. So this is a, the scanner. So we'll just enable the NIC and bring this one up. And let's go over to ICE and have a look at that authentication request that came in. So we'll have a look at the live logs. Remember the MAC address is ending FDF2. And, and there it is. There's the MAC that's come in. We've, we've learned the IP ending 110 and we've assigned the scanners SGT. So on the access switch, let's have a look at the auth session. So now we do have a session on gig 101 with that MAC address, FDF2. And we can have a look at the detail of that. FDF2, the detail. And you can see it learned the, the 1110, and we've got a, assigned an SGT of scanners, which is 36. Now, the IP to SGT mappings, we have another entry here now for the, the IP of the scanner with the scanner's SGT. So the switch now knows the groups of both our doctors and our scanner. And we have a new policy downloaded, which is doctors to scanners permit IP. So this is the new policy that's downloaded. So if we look at the policy matrix, this is our policy, right? Doctors to scanners, it was a permit IP. So that was the one that was downloaded. So let's have a look at the counters here then. So from doctors to scanners, we can look at enforcement counters. So let's send some traffic from doctors to scanners. So we're sending some traffic now. The doctor is sending traffic to the scanner. Remember, it's a permit IP right now. And you can see that the hardware permit counter is increasing from doctors to scanners. And if we refresh that, 
couple of times, you see that that is increasing. So this is how we enforce from one endpoint to another on the same switch. Now you might say we're not actually enforcing, we're actually permitting it. So if you wanted to deny it, you would just go to your policy matrix and you could change your policy. So instead of a permit, you could set a deny, for example. You would need to push the change. This, this initiates a radius change of authorization. And it's set, sent down immediately. And we're now denying the traffic from doctors to scanners. So that's how classification and um, enforcement would work on a single platform. We look at the if we look at the changed permissions, we see doctors to scanners is now a deny, and we'll be able to see the counters clocking up under hardware denied. So it's as simple as that, enforcing one endpoint to another on the same platform. They could be even on the same VLAN. It doesn't make any difference. They could be on different VLANs. Enforcement works just the same. OK. So let's look at enforcement use case now, not on a single platform, but on multiple platforms. So where does enforcement occur? I often get people ask me, you know, where does enforcement occur in the network? Well, enforcement occurs at the first platform in the traffic path, which has all of the following. A platform has to know the source IP to HTTP binding. So it has to know what group the source IP is in. It also has to know what group the destination IP address is in. The platform and a VLAN has to have enforcement enabled. And obviously a policy is needed to be downloaded from ICE, either the default policy or a specific policy. So let's say in this example, all these five platforms are configured to enforce on all their interfaces. And on the left, left we have our familiar doctor, in the doctor's SDT and on the right, we have a scanner in the scanner's SDT. Now, where does enforcement occur in this instance? Well, the first thing is we've just got IP flowing from left to right. It's just IP until I talk about something else later. But the left hand switch, it knows what group the source is in, but it does not know what group the destination IP is in. It's not been told. And the right hand switch knows what group the, the the scanner's IP is in, but it doesn't know what group doctors is in. So nowhere along this path does a single platform know both source and destination grouping, and therefore no enforcement occurs in this instance. Okay. Now, this is where propagation comes in. Okay, remember it's the middle pillar I talked about before. And let's take this same example where all platforms are configured to enforce. And at this particular moment in time, the left hand switch knows what group the doctor is in and the right hand switch knows what group the scanners is in. But one thing about propagation is that what we can do is propagate the source mapping information all the way through the path. So the destination switch knows what group the source IP is in. Now, this is something that we call inline tagging. We put the source HTT in the layer two frame. And so every packet sent from left to right here has the doctor's HTT inserted in it, such that when the packet reaches the right hand switch, the right hand switch knows what group that source IP is in. It already knows what group scanners is in. It has a policy and so it enforces it right here at this egress. That is where enforcement occurs in this instance. Now we have other propagation methods. One of them is called security group tag exchange protocol, which again is a simple protocol. It's peer to peer. So you could have one end in Australia and another end in the US. It doesn't make any difference. It's TCP. And so, you know, any third party or, or any switch that passes TCP or device that passes TCP can pass this information. It's very simple because all it does is it propagates IP to SGT bindings or mappings. That's all it does. So in this instance, if we've got an SXP connection from the right hand switch to the middle one, the middle switch will know what group that scanner is in because the IP to SGT binding has been sent 
to the middle switch. So when traffic flows in line from doctors to the middle switch, the middle switch knows what group the source is in, it will know what group the destination is in, and so this is where it will be enforced in this case. Now, security group tag exchange protocol is a function that you can enable on Identity Services Engine as well. So in this case, if we've got SXP sending that destination mapping down to the second switch, then the second switch is where enforcement would occur in this case, because it would inline tag from the first to the second switch. It would know the destination from SXP and it would enforce here. So this is where enforcement occurs. Now, there are some other propagation options. I already talked about Identity Services Engine using Security Group Tag Exchange Protocol, or SXP. And as ICE knows the dynamic mappings, because it's the one that assigned them, it can send those mappings through to any device that you want to enforce on the network, and you can enforce um, on that device. So that's propagation. We can also propagate through this ip 20 context through PX Grid. And FMC can consume that, so you can, you know, enforce on our next gen firewalls, as well as you know we can send this this map this uh, context to Stealthwatch, to other third party firewalls, and to you know we've got you know over a hundred eco partner systems that can receive this information through PX Grid. I already talked about we can propagate the information through inline tagging, and the question always comes up: Well, how do we go across a WAN, particularly? if it's a third party, I mean, if it's a Cisco SD-WAN, then we can transport it across IPsec through over um, SD-WAN. But if it's any other third party WAN, then we can also propagate it in line using GRE, IPsec, DMVPN, GitVPN, and online tag, you know, from end to end using those protocols. Again, we can use security group tag exchange protocol from device to device. And that way, a WAN will send that because it's just TCP. And of course, we have SD access. And what we do is we propagate the source SGT across an SD access fabric using VXLAN. So these are all methods that we can propagate this IP to SGT information. So there's a demo of SXP propagation and enforcement then. So what am I going to show? Well, on the left, we've got our favorite doctor with the doctor's SGT the same MAC and IP address ending 111. And on the right, we've got a camera, it's a Meraki camera, and it's been assigned into the camera's SGT. And if you remember this MAC, it ends 0334 with an IP address ending 50.100. And this is going to be a demo of SXP propagation. So we're just going to demo SXP from ICE, sending it down to the Cat9K on the right, and enforcing it on the right there at egress. So this is the demo. So we can have a look at the left switch and have a look at the auth session for the doctor. Remember, we're on gig 102 and the doctor's got a MAC address of 5622. And we can have a look at the detail of that again, just to remind ourselves of the SGT that are assigned to that. So this is the detail. That's the IP ending 111. It's doctor and it's assigned the doctor's SGT, which is 34. Now I'm going to move over to the right hand switch now and have a look at the auth sessions on the right hand switch. And here we've got a camera which is on gig 1010. And again, it's the MAC address ending 0334, if you remember. And we can have a look at the details. So this is our MAC address ending 5100. It's a Meraki camera and it's assigned into the camera's SGT. So let's have a look on the, at the policy on um, Identity Services Engine. Let's go over to ICE. So again, we'll go to Work Center, TrustSec, TrustSec Policy. And from doctors to cameras, so from doctors to cameras, we have a deny policy currently. So let's have a look at that that's been downloaded to the destination switch. It's the switch on the right hand side. Let's have a look at the permissions or policies that are downloaded. 
we do have a policy downloaded from doctors to cameras. It's that deny IP um, policy. So ideally, we want to be denying this traffic. But on the client, though, let's from the doctor, let's ping the camera. So that's 50.100. And we are permitting that traffic. So if you think about it, we're not propagating anything at the moment. We haven't got SXP from ICE. I haven't added that yet. So there's no propagation of the source SGT yet. So let's add that now. Let's add that classification or that propagation from ICE down to the destination switch. Just showing you in the live sessions, we have ICE is aware of the doctor here with IP 111 and it's assigned into the doctor's SGT. And we also have the Meraki camera authenticated into the network. Remember the MAC address ends 0334 with an IP ending 5100 and it's assigned the camera's SGT. So it knows the IP and the group, so the IP to SGT information. And this can be seen in the SXP database here. So you can see 165111 with an SGT doctors and the IP ending 5100 assigned the camera's SGT. So these are the IP to SGT bindings. But we don't have a connection yet down to the destination Cat9K. So let's add this connection. So I want to send these mappings to the destination Cat9K. Let's call it something that's meaningful. So then the Cat9K on the right. I'm going to give it the IP address of that Cat9K. So it's 1118. And the listener role is the peer. I want the Cat9K to listen to mappings from ICE. And I'll set the ICE persona. I'll just use the default password and I'll save it. So this ICE is now trying to set up a connection to the Cat9K to send these IP to SGT bindings. Now on the right hand switch, we also have to add the other side of the SSP connection. You have to add both sides. If I have a look at the SXP connections to begin with, SXP is enabled, but there are no connections yet. So we need to add a connection to go back to ICE. So let's add this side of the SXP connection. So I'm going to add the connection. The peer is Identity Services Engine. And the source is 1118. I'm just going to use the default password. And I'm going to say this end of the connection, mode local, is going to be a listener. I want to listen to these IP addressing mindings from ICE. OK, so that connection is now added. And these, because now they should match the switch to ICE, the connection should match. It should start to negotiate to bring this SXP connection up. So on ICE, if I do a refresh, it should be negotiating. You see there it's pending on. So it, the connection is coming up. And if I refresh again, it's now on. Or, or another way to look at it is up. And if I refresh this on the switch, it's on and up. So now it's up. The IP to SGT bindings on ICE will be sent over this connection to the switch. So if we have a look at the switch and refresh our IP to SGT bindings, show CTS, I'll look at role-based SGT map, all. You can see now I've got bindings from SXP and I have the binding from the source, the doctors, and I also have you know the other bindings. So it now has the source binding, and so it can now start to enforce that traffic from doctors to camera. So that's the that's the use case showing pro SXP propagation from ICE to an enforcement box. Now, let's say we wanted to change the policy. I mean, it's fairly straightforward to do that. So on ICE right now, from doctors to cameras, it's a it's a deny. So we could change it. We could change it to be a permit if you wanted to and save the change and deploy the change using radius change of authorization. And traffic starts flowing again. So that's the use case of propagation with SXP. Now, I want to show a demo as well because of inline tagging because SXP is a great protocol, but really you want to try an inline tag if you can, because that's done in the data plane. So this demo 
is to not use SXP now from ICE. I want to show inline tagging instead. Now, inline tag is, is enabled from the left switch to the, to the Cat 9500 in the middle at the beginning of this demo. But what I will show you is adding the configuration necessary to inline tag from the middle switch to the right hand one. And when we do that, the Cat 9K then will learn of the source group mapping through inline tagging and will enforce it at egress. Also on this demo, I'll show that you can see the SGT coming in from the inline tag. So I'll use monitor capture to show that SGT coming into that interface on the Cat 9K on the right hand side. So since the last demo, SXP has been disabled and the doctor is pinging the camera successfully. So even though there's a deny policy in place, there's no propagation of that source SGT yet because we haven't got inline tagging from source to destination. So on the left hand switch, I want to check the inline tagging. I'll show you the configuration necessary. So having a look on the left hand switch, it is inline tagging. This is the config needed to inline tag towards the 9500. So on that 9500, then the middle switch, I need to match that config on the receiving interface from that left hand switch. And so the config does match. So we're inline tagging on that first hop. Now on the interface towards the right hand side, we're not inline tagging yet. So let me just configure that and show you how simple it is. So we'll just go to that interface on the middle switch and we'll enable inline tagging. It's CTS manual, policy static, SGT2, tr trusted. Now SGT2 is just a default fallback. It won't be used in this instance. We're propagating from left to right. And on this right hand switch, I'll show you the config on the receiving interface. Again, it's not inline tagging yet. So we will enable inline tagging on this receiving interface. So again, poli uh, CTS manual policy static SGT2 trusted. And we've now enabled inline tagging all the way from left to right. And so we now start to enforce on that left hand switch because we're propagating all the way from left to right. We have a policy downloaded, so we are enforcing. Now, if we have a look on here, we'll show that we are enforcing it on that right hand switch. If we look at the policy that's downloaded from doctors to cameras and deny IP, and we can show the counters and we are indeed enforcing from doctors to scanners. We see the hardware denied counters. So just to prove that we are actually inline tagging, we can use a monitor capture on this right hand device looking at the interface that's coming from the 9500. So let's set up a monitor capture on that incoming interface and we'll match we'll match any traffic coming in. If I can use the match so it's match any and then we'll clear the clear the buffer to begin with and then we'll start the monitor capture. Now all I want to do is capture one of these pings. So let's go over to the client. Let's wait for at least one ping. Okay, there's one. So we'll go back, we'll stop the capture. So stop. And then we'll have a look at the list of captured packets, just the, just that's in the buffer. And um, we'll just look at the ones that have ICMP in them so there's all the icmps captured and remember our source ip is 1065111 and the destination ends 50.100 so that's ours it's frame number nine so if we have a look at the detail of frame number nine so if we have a look at the buffer detail and we'll begin at frame nine and you see here we've got the information we've got the layer two and in the layer two frame here we've got the cisco metadata field and in there you see sgt 34 which is doctors so we are indeed propagating the source sgt doctors 34 from left to right using inline tagging and that's how we enforce on the right hand side now looking at the time let's, let's move on to best practice i just wanted to talk about 
thinking about where to start in terms of the enforcement design process. So you really need to think about discussing what you want to protect in terms of assets. So discuss the assets to protect. So it might be cardhold data, it might be intellectual data, it might be you know users, the workforce, whatever it might be. Once you've got that, then that helps to determine the classification methods, how and where to classify. So you might classify them dynamically from ICE, that would make sense, or statically through IP to SGT or, or VLAN to SGT or subnet to SGT static classifications. And once you've understood that, then the environment will determine the enforcement options for the use case. So it might be virtual, physical on switches, routers, firewalls, on, on wireless LAN controllers, the 9800 possibly. And also the use case for user to DC access control. You may have firewalls on entrance to the DC. If you can just get you know, information to those firewalls, you may be able to solve some use cases for user to DC in terms of that use case. Or if it's user to user enforcement, then you might well have to do enforcement on the access switches. And the last part is propagation. So once you know what you want to protect, where you're classifying and where you want to enforce, that then leads you to what propagation methods you may want to use, or the ones that you may have to use if, if you've got some scenario where you can't perhaps use inline tagging. So this is the, the thought process when you're thinking of inf enforcement. And just a couple of slides, um, just to say that Cisco DNA Center can help you on the segmentation journey. It has AI endpoint analytics, and this helps you to classify your endpoints on the network. And by classify, in this case, I mean determine what is on your network. So if you've got a lot of unknowns on the left, well, once it's passed through the endpoint analytics engine, the idea is to be able to classify your endpoints um and profile them so that it's visible on the network you know what's on the network if you know what's on the network then it's easier to understand what sort of segmentation you need and the other app on cisco dna center is group-based policy analytics so this this app will receive these the um security groups from ice and also the ice profiles it also receives those those classifications from endpoint analytics. MSC is multi-factor classification, so we get that classification information from endpoint analytics. We also get some group information from what was formerly known as StealthWatch. This is the host group information, and also using NetFlow. And this allows group-based policy analytics to create graphs and tables showing you this group-to-group -group communications. But not only that, it shows you the ports and protocols being used and can use that to help you build your policy. So that's the point of the tool, is to help you build your policies based off of what's flowing on the network. So we won't go on to that demo, so I want to make sure we've got enough time for some questions. So there are some ICE resources here that um, Thomas normally shares in the webinars. And there are some related documents that are listed here within this document. So I will finish there. And um, uh, Riga, I'll, I'll ask if there's any questions or ask the audience if there are any questions. I'll uh, do my best to answer them. Excellent presentation, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, there is one question that we have here outstanding, um, and we'll go ahead and address that live for our audience. The question is, if I have only ICE to DNAC integration, and since NetFlow is directed to DNAC as well, will GBPA work efficiently or will we need uh, StealthWatch? Okay, great question. Yes, all we need is NetFlow sent to DNAC, and that is done through telemetry provisioning within the inventory in DNAC. So the config is sent down to the access devices, and NetFlow is sent to DNAC. You do not need StealthWatch for this. ICE will send the group information to the app on DNAC, and it can use the NetFlow that's sent to DNAC. Just bear in mind that StealthWatch is great. It's a great tool for you know um, anomalous flow behavior. Um, so typically, customers will have NetFlow to StealthWatch to um, detect anomalous flows, and will also have NetFlow sent to DNAC for this group-based policy analytics app, as well as for endpoint analytics, we use it for spoofing detection and for things like Talos IP reputation. 
Perfect. Thank you so much for addressing that. Uh, one other question that came in here. Um, the question is, so I thought I heard the product name Trust Analytics. Is the same? Is it the same as Policy Analytics or not, not a valid brand product name? Yeah, Policy Analytics is group-based. Policy Analytics is an app on Cisco DNA Center. And Endpoint Analytics is, is also an app on DNA Center for doing things. And what was the other term? Uh, let me take a look here. Um, policy analytics. Is it the same as policy analytics or is it not a valid brand product name? There was another term you used at the beginning as well. Oh, trust analytics. I apologize. OK, so trust analytics. So um, endpoint analytics classifies your endpoints and tells you what type of devices they are on the network. But as well as that, it will tell you and give you a trust score for them. So it uses a number of, uh, of different sources to tell you the trust level. So if, for example, spoofing has been detected or there are weak credentials maybe because we can log on testing weak credentials, we can also look to see if there are open ports. We can see if NAT's on the network, if if NAT isn't meant to be on the network, then we'll reduce the trust score, things of this nature. So trust analytics is something that's on endpoint analytics. Endpoint analytics provides your classification, what is the device, and also gives you a trust score of how trustworthy that endpoint is. Perfect, thank you so much. And then looking at the time here, I think we have time for just one more question. And um, so the question is, in the ISNAD section, within the trust tech section, you have two choices to publish changes from ICE, COA or CLI. If you choose CLI, you have to specify a user and password so ICE can SSH into the switch and apply the configuration. Uh, what is the best practice? Okay, that's a great question. And it depends on the scenario. That The first thing is, that that ICE, that ICE SSH function is not VRF aware. So if you've got something like an SD access border with multiple VNs or multiple VRFs, you cannot use the SSH option because it will just put it in the global table. It's not VRF aware. So you can't use it in that instance. Generally, people will use the radius change of authorization and send it from a PSN because you can choose which persona to send it from. So that's how you can send you can um, distribute them across your PSN your ICE PSNs. The only the only time that I would question using a COA is if people are using multiple matrices or the DEF CON function, which changes many many policies at the same time. And if you do that, then all the COAs are sent to each switch and you'll have multiples, and we can only sit, fit a certain number of COAs into every message. I think it's 24 or 25. So it sends multiples to each switch, and so that's a scenario with a very large network that I would probably shy away from that. And if you wanted that to be VN or VRF aware, I, you wouldn't be able to use the SSH function either. So if you've got a very big network that requires the use of multiple matrices, for example, then the recommendation is probably to use an external tool that is built to log on a parallel log on onto access devices and just to do a manual refresh, which just sends a command, which is a CTS refresh policy, and that'll allow the switch to come up to ICE and, and refresh the policy. So that's my recommendations.